welcome to Success Redefined with Dr. Tony Warner. I'm Dr. Tony, mama five, psychotherapist, author, and mentor. Here, you're going to find insightful discussions spanning science, psychology, and soul as the personal and professional meet, and we explore the intersection of what really matters. So success can be redefined with connection, healing, and fulfillment in mind. The overarching theme we're going to focus on today is around faith. And I'm joined today by Christy Christopher, where together we're going to have a conversation as we both share about our real lived experiences on how our faith and our tendencies to overfunction have really impacted our lives, our sense of success, our definitions of success, what we've learned about that process, what we have done to navigate it all. As women of faith, as mothers, as therapists, as business owners, and just as really passionate people, and so much more. So this is going to be such a good conversation for you to, for you to be here and be a part of. Christy has been working in the fields of psychology, spirituality, and transformational coaching for over 20 years. Her greatest passion is teaching her high-achieving clients to master both the spiritual or energetic and the physical realms as she supports them in shifting from overfunctioning to really resting in their inner knowing, their standing in their own personal sovereignty and creating their God-given work and gift in this world. Let's go ahead and get started with this conversation. Hello, 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 hello. I have Christy Christopher here with us today who is not only a colleague, but she is a friend who, gosh, we've known each other for years at this point, which went so quickly, I feel like. I can't believe it's been years. Yeah, right. <laughs> and we have been through a good amount together in those few years. That's a, uh, a very simplistic way to put that. But <laughs> I always love having the deep conversations that we get to have. And so I am really looking forward to being able to have this conversation between you and I, but being able to share it with other people who we've said, how many times have we said, we wish that we could <laughs> like share these conversations with people more and more and more. And, and now we get to do that. So thank you for being here, Christy. Well, thank you so much. Yes always love our conversations and it is awesome to actually record it and actually share it with people. And I just love any chance that we get to deep dive and, and uh, connect and see where the conversation takes us. Mm, me too. And I love that we can just be real. Like I, we were just saying that right before we went on, I was like, this is, you know, this is not a podcast that's teachy or preachy. Like we're just, we're having a conversation or an organic, authentic conversation. I was just telling Christy before we got on, you know, these bags under my eyes are going to be here for a while because with this pregnancy, I've been getting awoken at like 2 a.m. And it was the same with my last pregnancy, which was only a year ago. <laughs> so it's been a couple of years of just these random, I don't know, these weird nights of not much sleep. And yet it's always worth it, right? Like <laughs> the babies are always, sure. worth it. but these conversations energize me. So I am beyond happy and appreciative that we get to have this space together. We're going to be talking today about a, a topic that seems kind of big, but I think that we can pull it together in practical terms because I think we need that, right? We need the the powerful and we need the practical. And I think if we can pull those together in a way that fits and makes sense for, for folks, depending on where they're at in their journey, it can be really helpful. So we're going to be diving into a conversation around redefining success as faith-based woman, um, a historically overfunctioning woman and and a mom. And that's something that I know Christy and I can both relate to, but so many women, right, can relate to on so many different levels. And so, Christy, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're at with um, this 
overarching theme that we're going to be diving into today and mm -hmm. maybe even where you're located so folks have an idea of where you're from. Oh, nice. I'm in the Atlanta, Georgia area. Um, background and, you know, similar background as you with the psychology background and um, seminary background as well. And uh, been in the coaching realm for about a decade or so, working a lot with women around rediscovering their desire um, and entrepreneurship and, and business and right in this pocket of what is success for us, you know. Um, and yeah, I, I think I would characterize my entire life journey as one of, of a, of a faith, uh, based woman, um, but seeking out, um, the truth of that for my own experience, um, versus a lot of the dogma that we've all had to sort through when it comes to like, uh, God and um, life and how all that plays out. So mm. it's been a big part of my um, my ongoing search and ongoing exploration of, you know, who is God? What is the universe sort of like pulling us towards? And um, what do we need to let go of in order to like already be there versus trying to get somewhere? Mm, those are big questions. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've been asking them since I was little too. So <laughs> that's organic. <laughs> big questions, big questions, big answers. So you have this. I think it's a pretty. I think it's a pretty neat combination of the seminary, right? So you have this faith-based background that has been exposed to the religious faith as well as the spiritual faith. Um, yeah. But then you also have the background in psychology where you've done, you know, counseling, therapy, things in that clinical realm. And you, you do, you, would you say like you merge both of them now? Or how would you describe what you do now with those two areas? Yeah, I would definitely say, I don't know how to like untangle the two anymore. I think they just, I just work with them so fluidly because there's so much about our sense of self and our psyche and our relationship styles and all of that, that is so both impacted, um, by our faith or our spirituality and that our spirituality then can impact, you know, those things about us. So I do, I do see it as something that kind of, um, it, I think it's helpful to be always looking at both. Hmm. So they're married together for you. There's not a, like a separation. I think that in some, like there's, there's really a good benefit of like looking at them individually, but I feel like it's hard to like one impacts the other always. I think that's, you know what I mean? So yeah, I think it really does marry at the end of the day. Was it always like that for you? No, I don't think it was like <laughs> that. I think I very much was compartmentalized. <laughs> Because uh, it wasn't always like that for me either. So I, I was, just, I was yeah. curious to to hear your yeah. answer. I was pretty sure I knew what you are going to say. Yeah. <laughs> Which one did you start with? Like, did you start in the realm of psychology? Did you start in the realm of faith, spirituality? That's not even a word. It, it meant to be religiosity and spirituality, but I created a word. So, you know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> You can Guess do that when you're pregnant. <laughs> I'm a lot of sleep. <laughs> oh, man. Today's going to be a fun show. Okay. So which one did you start with first? So it's interesting because I, I guess I started with in religion because that was just such a cornerstone of my upbringing, um, you know, being raised in like a Western fundamental Christian church you know, with a very dysfunctional family dynamic that kind of plays into that, um, the lens that we put on God and life and, and how life works, you know? So I, I think because there was a lot of fear based in my upbringing in church of like, I think one of my main motivations was like this, like, oh, I got to get it right. You know, like I have got to, I got to get this right. Not just, um, my behavior or my performance and like being a good person, which that was certainly one of my main motivating factors, but also like get the truth right. You know, um, 
I think the longer I, I mean, I was like very immersed in church, which I know that's part of your story too. It's like the longer I was around religious people, the more I realized that not everybody had the same, even like beliefs about, you know, God in the right way. Right. So it made me feel anxious, almost like an existential angst of like, what happens when you get it wrong, you know? So there was this motivation of like wanting to figure it out and get it right. So, um, you know, I, I had that and I read my Bible a lot. I was very studious about, you know, learning, uh, the Bible and learning, you know, as much as I could, even when I was in middle school and high school. But ultimately I went away to college and I started to move towards psychology because I had a lot of relationship dynamics that were not going well in my life growing up too. So one of my other big pieces, um, was just, you know, I'm going to have a family and I'm going to raise them so much different from my own experience. And so I wanted to go into the field of psychology. Um, so I, I did that for a couple of years and then, you know, I was realizing, yeah, I think I'm struggling and wrestling more with this, getting it right of the truth of God and life and all of this stuff than I am the psychology stuff. And I went into seminary, um, which did not really answer any of my questions at all. It actually made me more confused. Um, <laughs> Um, because it was just, it's also like, it's all the lens of the professors that you're with, but like the lens of theology itself was not answering questions, but making my inner conflict more apparent to me Mm -hmm. that I have this like intuitive connection, you know, with God, but it was just so compartmentalized to go back from that. Where did we start? It was in separation, right? So compartmentalized from even my life, it was like this secret place that I had of my own, but it didn't get brought into my life and my relationships. And it was bumping up against all of these paradigms that I had been fed, all these belief systems that I had been, you know, had taken on. And so none of it could reconcile, you know, like into. It was like at odds with each other or like segmented. Yeah. And that's a good word segmented. Cause I would say if I could just put one word on my experience of being raised in a, you know, a fundamentalist, you know, Christian church like that, it, it would be separation. I think I was taught through religion separation. Like it's us and them in terms of like, we, you know, we have the right truth and then there's everyone else. And then there's like, there's, there's separation between us and God. And we're trying to like, work our way towards, you know, bridging that separation, wow. you know? And then I think I felt in the separation internally between like, almost like my spirit self and like, and my performing self by, you know, I had how I showed up in the world. It's not, th- it's so sad to, to hear that and to, and, and, and I read, and I know what you mean by that too. So it's like a sadness that I can, I could understand because faith is meant to connect us. And then when faith is filtered through certain rigid religious lenses, it teaches separation, right? Or condemnation, which to me is the opposite of what the foundation of my faith is really intended to be paved in, right? The intention for for me, for my faith to be paved in is that love and that connection and that unity. And that I, I, growing up, so my parents are both pastors and going into different churches, uh, people, they, they did not want us there even before they had ever met us. Like they hadn't met us and they didn't want us there because um, I, so my dad is black. My mom is white. Um, people didn't want a female pastor. My dad was often the black pastor of white churches. So white churches didn't want a black pastor. And then they also got divorced from one another. And so they didn't want divorced pastors. And then there's me and my sister, these mixed, right? These mixed girls that have all of these different things that don't fit into their categories. And what do you think of a pastor's kid? They're either, I grew up hearing this all the time either the angel or the devil. Like, this is like what you think. (laughs) Like, they're either horrific, horrible human beings that rebel all the time, or they're these perfect little angels that everyone should, you know, try to strive to be like. And it's like, 
like and I'm just like I don't fit in any of these boxes I don't know why you don't like us because you never met us like I just none of it made sense to me and then hearing people speak preach read the word of we're supposed to love each other we're supposed to be there for one another we're supposed you know I, I just was so confusing outwardly as a kid and so I'm hearing from you that faith wise you were you had created thoughts and beliefs that success to be a successful faith-based woman at that time, a child was to do what was right. So you pursued, right. The, the search of what was right. And for me to be successful was to prove that I was enough because I never fit in anywhere. And I just wanted to show like, no, look, I have a lot to give. No, look, I can do this for you. No, look, 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 look. Like, I, I, I'm not this whatever it is thing that you think I am. I, of course, didn't realize it at the time, but I think everyone grows up with some kind of messaging about what it is to be successful in faith if they're growing up with any kind of connection to faith, religious or otherwise. Yeah. Does that fit yeah. kind of what you think, like your definition of success was back then? For sure. Yeah. And I, and I, I would say for sure, like, I mean, then maybe you will, you would feel the same way that like, that was really the beginning of what would set me up to be an overfunctioner, Right. I mean, how can you stop overfunctioning if like it this it's down to like like look, I have value. Look, I I get, is is a is about something as deep as your faith and your relationship with God and life and how things are gonna go, right? Like that's not just trying to please one person. That's like that's the deepest thing that kind of matters to us if we, you know, if we're focused on it like that. So mm -hmm. I mean, imagine like the endless cycle of overgiving and <laughs> trying to prove that we have value to offer so that, you know, we feel like we are measuring up. Hmm. Would you say that you see a lot of folks in your work? And I know you work mainly with women. So women in your work that have experienced pain, shame, or blame around their faith journey? For sure. Yeah, I would say that is the most common thing that I see. Um, and usually, you know, if, if we're talking about women who are kind of reaching that midlife, they're like mid thirties to mid forties kind of, you know, place. Like I usually see one of two things that they've literally just sort of put like the whole God conversation on a shelf somewhere. It's not like they don't believe in God. It's not that they don't even like in some ways like value that but there's just like so much around it that they kind of put it on the shelf and they're just like I just can't with that you know like they're just too wounded by religion or church or whatever you know or there's you know some women who like then have kind of doubled down on it and they just kind of keep trying to figure out the same kind of thing that I was trying to figure out you know is like what does this even mean to me and like why you know, I don't want to abandon any of this, but like, what does this even mean to me? Mm. And to use your, your kind of language, it's like, what does a successful relationship with God look like, you know? And so they, they may have really stayed maybe somewhat on the hamster wheel of that, trying to figure it out with some progression, um, but still not realizing some of the core things that might be underneath driving it, the fears the, you know, the shame, the guilt, the, all of those things that are kind of brewing beneath the surface. That's so hard because these kinds of conversations, I think, can easily be misconstrued into an all or nothing battle, right? So what we don't want to do is the separation, right? So we don't want to be in the, the, the church, and I'm using air quotes, element, and saying it's us versus them or us and them or we're right in their wrong. But also we don't want to be against the church element just saying the same thing. And it's like that's that's not the purpose of this conversation, right? Like what we're talking about is some maybe to use more gentle words like compassionate curiosity mm -hmm. around what 
what is faith for us as individuals and how have we been defining it all mm-hmm. of these years in the background well sometimes without even noticing it yeah can we have some compassion and curiosity for that yeah and I think a lot of women are uh I and in fact I just did a whole bunch of research over the last few months I've just been doing um some interviews you know with women who are leaders a lot of them own businesses and stuff like that and you know, this, this is one of the areas that I was just, you know, gaining information and asking questions around. And, and most of them are, you know, they're self-seekers. So in other words, like they've gone their own path of wrestling with these things like you and I have, but they have a really deep desire to find some sort of community or container, right. To be able to safely be in a, in conversation with other women about this, to have that compassion, to have the curiosity, to not have somebody like all of a sudden, like, you know, jump up and, and be like, that's not right. You know what I mean? That kind of a, of a vibe, but to share not just their, um, their own wisdom that they've g- gained by being in that exploration, but to ask the questions that they're still wrestling with and see what other people's experience might be without feeling like, they they need to um, just immediately and automatically agree with anybody else's experience. Mm. Community mm-hmm. and safety. Those are the like those are the two main words that stuck out to me as you were speaking. Community and safety. Don't we all want that? For sure. Crave that, desire that, and then in pursuit of that, for me. I want to feel safe and being myself in community. I never questioned my faith with God. In fact, I never questioned my relationship with God. My questioning was the confusion of why doesn't what I inwardly feel so strongly match what is, what is being portrayed to me outwardly. It was just so confusing for me, but I didn't, I didn't feel that sense of, safety and community. And I wanted to, my, my human Mm -hmm. form, my physical self wanted to feel that and doing a bunch of like taking to action, becoming someone who over functions. It led me down a path and I'm not going to say it's just because of my relationship with faith. It, this is, there's layers, right? There's the social layers. There's all of these different layers that played into it for me. But it ultimately made it look like I was very successful outwardly because I got a lot of things done. I was really good at what I did. If I put my mind to something, I did it. Like so, over functioning served me well in that I would I would show that I could do stuff. I would show that I could help people. I would show like I could show all of that. But I didn't. I still didn't feel inside the safety in the community that that's a to me that there's a different kind of success inwardly that I feel with that now like there's a fulfillment there's a a freedom a meaning a purpose that I feel with that and I couldn't put words to that then but it was almost just like I was I was chasing success in ways that were leading me to more and more burnout, more and more mental health challenges, more and more relational challenges. Like it was setting me up for (laughs) the irony. It was setting me up for failure when I was actually trying to pursue success, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. What was the big switch for you where you started to choose more from that inward space of, of authenticity and knowing yourself versus like that over-functioning, trying to measure up. Mm, I honestly, Christy can't say it was one switch. I'm very stubborn. (laughs) (laughs) There were a lot of switches. And I think that's how it happens is you you get the little, the little nudge, yeah. The little nudge, the little nudge, the little nudge, a bit, a little bit bigger nudge, a little bit bigger nudge, a little bit bigger nudge. <laughs> and then it's like, finally, like it, you get knocked upside the head with the brick. Like that's what they call rock bottom, right? That's the, 
for folks like me, like really stubborn and really committed to the ways that work, right? Um, that I that happens all the time. That's what had to happen to me. I mean, I, gosh, growing up, I took um like just like over the counter pills multiple times, um to to see if it, I would die or not. Um, I started cutting myself when I was in middle school uh, i was benching and purging in middle school all the way through like high school i was i had all of these unhealthy ways of trying to deal with not feeling safe in community with not feeling like i had a place all of these unhealthy ways i didn't know that that is what was going on at the time the whole time i was still looking out really successful because i was still getting stuff done people didn't know what was going on so those were the the pain that I was feeling, the loneliness that I was feeling. Those were big nudges, but I didn't know what to do with them, right? So I found outlets that some of were some were healthy, like journaling, um, petting the dog, snuggling with the dog. Like I did have some healthy ones, but I I had some very unhealthy ones, some very unhealthy ways of dealing with it, and even into my young adulthood, like I had to keep getting nudged and nudged and nudged and nudged and nudged and nudged until finally I wound up, I was hospitalized, mandatory um, hospitalization. And it was not a pleasant experience at all. It was not a helpful experience at all. It was a very disappointing experience. And um, that did change things for me because I felt anger mm. after that. Uh, which I don't think I really allowed myself to feel as much prior prior to yeah. that. And anger is one of those things. I think sometimes when we're pursuing success, as women in particular, we don't always allow ourselves to feel and express anger. Yeah. And then it gets, you know, stuck. And and it if it stays stuck, it keeps growing. Yeah, for sure. And anger can be such a powerful catalyst, you know, for, you know, things that are going on in our lives. And um, when we suppress it, like, I, I, I especially think anger suppressed definitely causes like illness and stuff too. And us, it's, it's there for a reason. It's a signal. It's a, it's telling us something, but because we have been traditionally taught that that's not an emotion that we can have or express then we don't allow what's underneath the anger to come forward and be seen in the light so that we can let it show us and teach us what we need to see, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was your shift for overfunctioning for you to start to notice, like, this is what's going on and I want to try to do it differently? You know, I think the very, <laughs> speaking of being stubborn, um, I've been called that since I was little as well. So <laughs> Um, I still, I constantly think about that for myself. I'm like, am I stubborn here still? No, <laughs> it's like, but, um, you know, I, it, it has taken, uh, me a lot of hard hits as well, especially, um, in my twenties and thirties to, uh, really wake up to certain things. But my first one was, you know, I was 23 and was in a very toxic relationship at the time and still, going to seminary and all the things and wrestling and um, had uh, my own kind of like date rape experience that I had not expressed that it was down to speaking of being angry, but not, but not feeling like I had the right to be angry, you know, all of that uh, just, just had holding so much right internally, not bringing any of it into the light, not talking to anyone about it. And then um, so I was just getting sick and I ended up with late stage ovarian cancer at 23 and, and it was interesting because I, when you were, when you were saying like, you got angry, I, that was the first time that was my first encounter with anger. And, and I, I watched as I felt angry towards God, because I felt like I had done so many things, right. I've been trying to like, you know, be the typical good girl and do all the right things and be a good person and always give more than I received and like, take care of everyone in my life. Like all the things, right. Like why? I'm like, God, I don't understand. Like I am doing everything I feel like that I've been told that you want me to do. Why is this happening to me basically? And, and more than that, I was just like, okay, like if this is where we're at, like, then help me understand, like, 
am I going to live through this? What do you want from me? Where we, you know, what, you know? Um, and I sort of isolated myself for several months and, and got really quiet, did a lot of meditating and reading and like just trying to like basically wrestling with God, right? Asking these questions and like feeling like, I feel like everyone, you know, around me is always talking about you talking to them and telling them and giving them direction and all this. And I don't feel like I'm ever receiving that. And I was just sort of determined and it, still being stubborn in a way <laughs> that I was going to like, you know, get some kind of answer from God, right? Which, you know, doesn't always play out um, the way we want. But interestingly enough, I did have a very like powerful experience with God because I was in the shower, um, you know, one day during that that time of being isolated, not really talking to a lot of people. And my my constant question to God was, am I going to live? Like, it was almost like, you know, how you just like want to know what's going to happen so you can just accept it and like deal with it. Like, okay, I've only got two years to live. Then let me just deal with two. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just want it. It's, a, it's kind of a form of control, but like, you feel like you can handle the thing if you know it, name it, whatever. And that was kind of my constant question. And um, so I'm, I'm, I was in the shower and I literally audibly, you know, heard God's voice. And he said, do you want to live? Hmm. And he just, it was just the, the most simple, profound question, which was really just my, my own question kind of coming back at me. But it, I mean, when like something like that happens, there's such a, there's an energetic to it, right? Like it kind of hitting you on like a cellular level. There's so much data inside, like a simple phrase that might be uttered to you like that. But it showed me three things. One, that I wasn't living. Mm. I had not been living at all. I wasn't living my life. I was living all these expectations and I really wasn't living at all. And like, I, I just immediately had this awareness of like, wow, I'm like slowly dying and, and like killing myself in a way and literally physically now getting that reflection back. Um, and it showed me secondly that... I had a choice, which felt like a, the biggest epiphany because I didn't feel like in my relationship with God and the whole religion thing that I had choices. I was just trying to figure out the right thing to do. Right. So for God to ask me a question and, and present it in a way of like, what do you want? Was like, you're asking me a question, you know? And so like, that was like, almost like startling, almost like, I don't know what to do with that, you know? And the third thing was just that what I wanted and what I desired mattered to him. I could feel it in the question. What I wanted mattered. And that had been like the precipice of my whole life up until then. Because even as a little girl, I can remember like laying in bed at night, praying for God to take my desires away because it was so painful to have these desires, which part of those were needs. Let's just be honest about it. That weren't getting met. But these desires, I, I was so full of desire, but everything in my life was a no and you can't and that was wrong and all the things. So it was so painful to have them that I was just like, would pray for him to just take them away from me so that I just wouldn't have that angst and that, you know, that pain. And so the fact that he asked me that question and like it, it re made me realize that my desires did matter yeah. him on some level. And of course, there was a whole long journey of like, processing that experience and then what did I do with it of course but um but the, you know like do you want to live and that question still comes up for me sometimes when I'm stuck in an overfunctioning pattern because that is not living that is not living mm. it's that's a I can't even find the word that's a it's a hard hard question to receive in the middle of such a physically challenging diagnosis. Yeah, for sure. I do think that it is one that is worth asking. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe even adding on to that as we contemplate how we want to redefine success for ourselves you know do you want to live and how do you want to live yeah how do you want to live how do you want to show up in this life 
if you choose to live it? What what does what do you want that experience to be led by? Because we don't without intentional pauses or forced pauses like like <laughs> yours, like ones I've had as well. Do we ask ourselves those questions or do we just stay on the hamster wheel, stay in the rat race, stay chasing the carrot, stay trying to prove, stay trying to please, stay trying to X, Y, or Z, right? Like, I, don't, I think that if we are having such a hard time, which let's just be real, our society over time has created this very high level of action and mm-hmm. achievement yeah. being the measurement, the standard of success, which oftentimes equals self-sacrifice. And then you get to wear that like a badge of honor, right? So is that is that what we want to keep doing? Is that what we want to keep chasing? And then believing that's going to make us feel successful, knowing every time we we hit a goal, we hit a milestone, we get something done. If there is joy in that, it is very fleeting. Yes. The only time we can actually feel joy in a prolonged, deep way is if we're willing to be present in the moment, pause and appreciate the here and now, right? Like, so if we're always, what what I, what I say, I was addicted to action. I didn't realize it until much later, but I had become a, literally addicted to action. My brain and my body, my nervous system were wired to, I had to keep going, 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 doing, 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 boo, boo, right? Like I was as you say, over-functioning. And I wasn't going to pause. I was not going to slow down if there was not some kind of divine intervention. Yep. Yep. And that's why, that's how we like look at these hard things that happen in our lives and we go, okay, I'm grateful for that because had that not happened, I would not have slowed down, right? Mm. Not not have slowed down, not have stopped the hamster wheel, you know? Yeah. And, and did that play into this, your journey with overfunctioning and faith? Did that play into then motherhood for you as well? For sure. I think motherhood definitely um, brought me back to another like automatic almost over functioning state Mm -hmm. my girls are only a year apart so they're really close together and um and yeah I just was stayed at home and you know kind of ran my own little business on the side still you know just still doing all the things um but it it because I was so neglected in my own childhood I over to try and make sure that they never felt like that while also like not putting anything down. Do you know what I mean? So like that stubbornness of like, well, I can still just do it all in all seasons. And um, so I definitely still over-functioned in, in a lot of ways, but I think I, I think the experience of that I had at 23 would, would echo back quicker where I would, sort of ask this question based on that question of, do you want to live of like, is this freaking life? Let me just wait a minute. Like, let me just pause. Like I would, maybe I would get a little bit down a road and I would just notice that, you know, I'm pushing things. I'm pushing the river again. And like, it's not really bringing fruit life that I want it to be like, you know what I'm saying? And so I would, I would notice that quicker. I would be like, wait, let me just step back for a second. Let me ask myself, you know, Where's this all coming from? Um, but I definitely like, I mean, my my girls are 18 and 19 now. So it's like who I am now, man. If I could go back, I would definitely be in more of a state of rest <laughs> than I was then, you know. Um, because I there's so much about motherhood that just brings all of that back up, in my opinion, and to be presented in a whole new way. And it's even harder to lay down. Mm, gosh. It, it's so it's beautiful and chaotic and a lot of in between as we talk about faith and overfunctioning and womanhood and motherhood all interwoven together and how much they influence one another. And there's, it really is, they're all intersecting with one another in 
so many ways and there's so many nuances. And, and, and that's why I like having these conversations because sometimes I think that we want to make things so black and white, so all or nothing that it leaves out so many nuances and then we can feel more alone. Yeah. Like, how, how many people are going through something even remotely similar to some of what we're talking about? And so like, oh, yeah, it's like, that makes sense. Why my faith is coming up here while I'm struggling with my faith here after becoming a mom or during this season of motherhood or while I'm trying to create my business and I'm over-functioning here. And it's like, that was one of my frustrations when I was building my businesses initially was I was like, okay, so you join this, this community, right? You, you sign up, you invest, you join this community. But like all they're talking about is business. I'm like, well, there's a bunch missing because either people aren't people in here are not feeling successful because they're neglecting the rest of their lives or their health is suffering. I don't really care if, <laughs> if I'm making a ton of money and my marriage is falling apart and I'm disconnected from my children, that's success. Like that just, it doesn't make, we need to talk. We need a space. Of course, we can't talk about all of the things in all of the spaces. We need boundaries. But to pretend like, they don't matter or to not have a space where the full multifaceted self can be brought to the table, I think is a disservice. That's not the right word is, is indicative that there's something missing. Yeah. And that's part of what fueled actually this podcast was some of my, mm -hmm. some of my thoughts about that. Cause I'm like, why aren't we talking about the different aspects of this? Like what, Success is not just financial success. Success yeah. isn't about like just being the perfect mom. Success isn't like it's not just this or just this or just this. Can we actually be real about this? So yeah. just, the nuances, right? Yeah, the nuances and like just and like a more holistic picture because it feels like even if we are attempting to be good at all of those things. We're usually like, oh, I'm doing good over here, but this ball dropped over here. So now like I got to go, you know, like that's what we're doing all the time. And, you know, and for sure we can't focus on all the things that all the time at one time, you cannot do that. But, but the, these facets of us and these, these um, areas of our life all matter. And when one of them, you know, which is what I see a lot with successful women in entrepreneurship and business is like when one area is really thriving, there's usually one area of their life that is really not going well. Um, but then the fear of like letting go of that success that's going on over here to try to tend to what's failing, it creates an, a whole, a total, like total, like identity threat, like an existential crisis, right? Like, Oh my God, what would I do? You know? And, and I think it's sad that a lot of, a lot of what's out there would encourage you to you know, make a extreme move. And sometimes we do need to make extreme moves, but like, but maybe that the space to just be in the conversation to start to look at your life differently and incorporate all of these things would be of much more benefit to like sit, just sit still for a second and, and start to ask the questions to have a space to be listened and heard and reflected back to and, and have the contemplation until there is clarity of like what you want to do within balance. Hmm. That makes me think of when I was when I was building my second business, which has evolved so much since then. But at the time, it was a coaching business. I don't refer to it as that anymore. Um, I had I had gotten back into overfunctioning. <clears throat> I wasn't burnt out. I had been before. I wasn't burnt out, but I had gotten back into overfunctioning. And had I had financial success as a result of that overfunctioning at the time, I would not have done the healing that I needed to do to repair my marriage, to make it anew. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I would not, we wouldn't be in the home that we live in now because we've moved since then. We wouldn't have had the two children that we've had since then because I'm now pregnant with our fifth, right? Like we would be, so over-functioning is also another way for us to, to, to cope, but 
it's it's typically like not healthy. It became for me, um, it looked like outward success, but internally it was it was like a defense mechanism, right? It, it, it kept me from having to slow down to deal with some of the the pain and the challenge and the hurt and the things that I couldn't control and all of the all of the the trauma, all of those things. But when the overfunctioning stopped working for me, uh, some I, I was like, I had to figure something. Like what? Yeah. What, what? The pain and the hurt and that right? Like so. All right, got to deal yes. with it. <laughs> like I'm doing all of this and it's not working. What the heck? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> then we sit down and we're like, what in the world? <laughs> exactly. And come on, like how many of us haven't felt that way at some point, right? Like why are you doing all of the things? Why is nothing happening? Mm. Mm. There's a place for us to look. There's a hood for us to open up and look under. Why are we doing all of these things in the first place? Are there things that we're trying to avoid or escape or whatever, you know? And I was, I didn't realize it at the time, but in retrospect, my life would be very different. My relationships would probably not nearly be as rich because that healing wouldn't have happened in the way that it had. If my business immediately, my second business had immediately taken off with that financial success, the way that I was pushing myself to make it do at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. When you say all that, I mean, like that just has the essence of God all over it because that's how much he loves us, that he, he wants us to have the success, but he doesn't, if he, if we created from overfunctioning and from uh, burnout and all of this, then we'll have to stay there in order to sustain it. And that, and that is not what he wants for us because and it's, I, not sustainable. I, it's not sustainable. He wants us to be able to sustain it. And, and he also like wants us to be able to create really from a place of rest, not that we are in action, but in a place of internal rest, which can only come from closing that gap of separation that we're talking about that we started with, because the over-functioning when we're in that there, we're in a separation from ourselves. We're in an internal separation, you know? And so he, I, my experience of God is that he first and foremost is trying to bring us always back home, always back home to him, always back home to ourselves, back home to our own like unique blueprint and design and how we're supposed to operate. But most of all, back home to a place of beloved identity, which means we are exactly and only loved right now in this moment as we are. There is nothing that we can do to make ourselves more loved in the future. You know, there's there's nothing that we can change. That, like none of that is is ever going to change the truth that he's always trying to bring us back to, which is that we are completely, perfectly, wholly loved right now. Mm. And from there, we we live a very different life. Very different life. I, I remind myself still with fair regularity that things are working out even if I don't understand how right now. Mm. They're working out. They're going to work out even if I don't understand how right now. And the the example I just gave about, you know, the the business and my relationship and all that stuff is is just one of so many examples if if I think if any of us were to honestly look back at our lives and be like, at the time, I had no idea why this crap was going down and I was really hurting or pissed, right? Like I was really in the, mm, right? Mm -hmm. And if we, at any point in time along that journey, allowed some space for grace or healing or just any any space for something different beyond us focusing on that negative that negativity, then something could ha something came out of that. Maybe it was a connection. Maybe it was a perspective shift. Maybe it was uh, a different job. Maybe it was, it, it could have been so many things. Could have been something big or something small. But it, it, I think if we all honestly looked back about what we thought should have happened or whatever, there are so many pieces there that yeah. later on, maybe even a decade or so later, begin to make sense. And you're like, wow. Yeah. I couldn't have come up with that if I tried, right? The, the, the chaos that is also 
so intentional at like this universal level is yeah. I'm, I'm in awe of it. Yeah. But I think the more that we can reflect on that and, and sit with that, the more we realize that is really the gold of our lives, you know, like that is the gold. And that's, that's why, you know, the name of, of my business is women knowing. Um, and that's why the knowing, because that those moments, and we, like you said, we may not know it in the moment, but we look back, those are the moments where we have these knowings, like these gifts that we could have never orchestrated for ourselves that no one can take away from us. No one can take away a knowing and that is real transformation. That is a way forward that we couldn't have created ourselves. Yeah. That knowing. Yeah. I, I have come to redefine my definition of success through the lens of faith and otherwise in, in so many ways. But one is kind of what we're hitting on here is before I thought that I needed to control and fix and figure everything out on my own, but really leaning into faith, there's a level of trust and surrender where it's not that I don't, you know, hold myself accountable or anything, but it's that I can feel safe and supported even mm -hmm. in the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And that's not something that I think most people yeah. Uh, can can truly say and mean unless they have become aware of some of their own you know challenges and are practicing being aware of this. But I'm curious, Christy, mm -hmm. looking back on our conversation today and and the life that you've lived so far, mm -hmm. how would you redefine success for yourself? Mm -hmm. I think. If I could talk to my younger self, I would tell her that success is really discovering the truth of who you are, your own essence, and being like so committed to your true self-expression in every given moment mm -hmm. and finding your way back to that alignment of who you are and your own purpose and not being afraid to, you know, show up and see what you might could create in the world, see what might get reflected back, you know, and like not approach that from a place of fear, but allow that, that this world of duality of contrast that we live in to be a magical experience of showing you you know, the different colors of, of experience and allowing all of them to impact you, the good, the bad, the painful, the beautiful, and not to waste this human experience to me is to be successful. Mm. There's this sense of like courageous, authentic self-expression with self-reflection and self-growth all bundled up in what you just said. And I think those are pieces for all of us to consider, to contemplate as we, you know, decide if we want to continue to redefine success for ourselves in our lives and all the facets that come along with that. So thank you so much, Christy, for sharing the space with us, being with us, talking with us, being real with us, going <laughs> deep with us as you always do, which I love, you know, going deep is not for everyone and that's okay. I like going deep. So that's what we do here. <laughs> we do. <laughs> we do here. Uh, Christy, for folks that want to follow you, connect with you, or explore the work that you offer in this world, where can they find you? Yeah, the best place to find me would just be on my website. Uh, it's www.christychristopher.org. And uh, you can sign up for my new monthly newsletter there and find any anything uh, anything new I have going on. Um, so yeah. That's the best place to Okay. Thank you Get so on much. Over. Connect with Christy. She's always putting things out there that help us to reflect, to contemplate, to challenge ourselves. And um I'm I'm right there with her. I think that we need that. We we need meaningful connection, but we need to be willing and able to challenge ourselves and, and to reflect. 
and that's that's part of what helps us heal as well as as be united in a in a healthier way. So thank you everyone for joining us today. If you're on YouTube, please check the comment section. Leave a comment, leave a question, leave a contribution. Help cultivate this community in a way that is meaningful for you. And until next time, go out, enjoy meaningful success. And may it benefit you, bless you, and then go out and make positive ripple effects in this world. Bye, everyone. Links related to this episode can be found in the show notes section. Want to submit questions about success, satisfaction, healing, and relationships, health, or work? You can do that free and anonymous at drtonywarner.com, where you'll find other resources there as well. Did you benefit from this episode? You can subscribe, like, and share with another to pass it on because anyone can listen on the go with this podcast audio available on all major podcasting platforms.